All right. Last day of the of the school week. So what we're going to be going over is universal gravitation and starting a little bit of work. Yeah, work. Work, work, work. Yeah, that's right. So first, to clarify where I ended last class period, I don't think time uh, – I was overcomplicating it. The, the acceleration is going to be – just that it that that's the entire calculation and i was overcomplicating things and getting myself confused and saying things wrong so got to clarify yeah that was the correct way of doing it the, the total acceleration toward the center is the downward acceleration and that's 1.6 g's according to the problem and so then the problem asks notice i have additional pieces on this slide that's the same problem so it asks, what's the speed? So solving for speed, speed squared, 1.6 g times the radius. Well, it's 1.6. What's the value for g? 9.80 meters per second squared. And then the radius, which it told me was 14 meters. So that's the speed squared. So you just multiply those through and square root it. And that tells you how fast you'd have to be going around that curve to have a downward acceleration of 1.6 g's, meaning 0.6 g's more than what gravity alone would do. So the normal force is pushing you down 60% of what you normally have when you're sitting in a chair. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure I went through that because I flubbed it up in class, last class period. Well, I thought that was a question. One more thing before we go to gravitation is some interesting other things that are related to centripetal force. And how I mean by related is when you learn about centripetal force, what is it that most people think that they know that's related to centripetal force? Centripetal force. And centripetal force is, I told you, a fictitious force, didn't I? Fictitious, but what does fictitious mean? Wow, that's exactly the <laughs> What's up with that? So how does he know the answer exactly? That's oh, good though, right? So the fictitious force, right? Fictitious in normal everyday parlance would be, it's not real. But fictitious forces are forces that appear to be real, but aren't. And so you ask, why does centrifugal force appear to be real? Well, we talked about that, talking about riding in the car and sliding across. And does it... So it appears that there was a force pushing you outward. But what was really happening was inertia was trying to make you go straight, because that's what things naturally do. And you had forces trying to make you change direction because the car was. So then we get to, is centrifugal force ever real? And the answer, maybe surprisingly, is that if you are in a reference frame that is accelerating, then it can be real, right? It's based on the reference frame. If you're on a merry-go-round, the merry-go-round seems like the seats are stationary. So if you say, I'm here, and my sister's here, and my brother's in the seat ahead of me, and they're stationary, in that reference frame, then centrifugal force is real. Because the reference frame itself is accelerating, and because the reference frame itself is accelerating, then the centrifugal force becomes real. So, bottom line, we do all of our physics in inertial reference frames. That's reference frames where the law of inertia works, where you stay in constant motion unless a force acts on you. And if you're in an inertial reference frame, then centrifugal force is fictitious, does not exist. Now, other fictitious forces include the Coriolis force. Now, notice up here I have the Coriolis effect. Coriolis effect is very real. Coriolis force, though, is fictitious. So what is the Coriolis effect? Right, so that, that's the time. That's why we're doing it here. The Coriolis effect, is anyone familiar with it? 
Yes, yes, would, which, which is why I have those pictures there. But the Coriolis effect, at its root, is actually really simple. Imagine, if you will, that you are on this rotating platform going around a circle. You have a velocity that is tangential, right? That's tangent to the direction of motion. Just that one. If suddenly you are thrown straight out, then your velocity in that direction stays fixed, but you're, you have velocity in that direction now. And as you travel out, what's happening to things on this platform that are passing you? I said they're passing you. Why would they be passing you? That, that was actually the point I was going to make. Why would things on the platform be passing you as you went out this way? Because farther out, they were traveling faster in the tangential direction. Remember from class on Wednesday that we had that tangential speed was V is omega R. And so if you go further out on the radius of the solid object, the tangential speed is faster. But if something was ejected with the tangential speed of in here, as it moves out, it's moving, you know, in that sideways direction, but the things on this are moving faster. So if you were to actually trace the path of something that was here and shot outward as this rotates, it would actually appear to rotate away from the direction that this is spinning. That's what we call the Coriolis effect. On the Earth, of course, the Earth is a sphere, something like this. And so if you're here at the equator, uh, the equator's right here, and you're spinning on the Earth, and then you throw a ball forward, or forward, northward, you throw a ball northward, the fastest, the farthest from the axis of rotation on the Earth is at the equator. So as it goes north, it's going toward the axis of rotation, the radius of rotation is getting smaller. So that means that the things on the surface of the Earth are going at a slower speed eastward than the ball is, because they're smaller radius. I'm just looking at the one student who's responding to me. She now nodded her head like she understands. So I assume everyone is with her. So if you are on the equator and you throw, throw a ball north, it's actually going to appear to deviate to the east because the Earth is rotating toward the east and the equator is going faster east than anywhere else on the Earth. And so you throw a ball straight and it appears to curve as you watch it on the surface of the Earth. It's not really curving, that's right. It's our reference frame is actually not perfectly inertial. And so we have what we call a Coriolis force because if it's going to change its motion according to Newton's first and second laws, there needs to be a force. And so why is that important? You know, you can demonstrate lots of fun ways. We, I won't tell you the story because it turns out those things are supposed to be, anyway. Um, you can play around like on a, a, well, not a Ferris wheel there, not so good because they go like this, um, but a merry-go-round and throw a ball and you can see the effects. But we also see that effect with things like weather systems, tornadoes. Tornadoes, well, okay, well, let's talk about hurricanes because hurricanes are a lot easier to talk about. What causes a hurricane? Uh, high pressure. Ooh. High pressure where, low pressure where? Yeah. <laughs> I've seen the discovery. You, you have to have a hot spot on the ground, which basically is warm ocean water, and then you have to have a low pressure up in the high atmosphere above that. You have to have both pieces. And what happens then is the air will get sucked into the ground and go up. But as it gets sucked in, then because of the Coriolis effect, if you're in the northern hemisphere, if it's going north, it's going to deviate to the right. If it's going south, it's going to deviate to the right still. Um, and it's going to make it spin. And so that's how you get the cyclonic motion in a hurricane. Now, what about in the southern hemisphere? If you're on the equator 
and you throw it south, you're still going faster than the ground below. So what's going to happen? It's going to appear to deviate again to the east because that's the direction the Earth is rotating. And so the Coriolis effect causes rotation in the opposite direction of the southern hemisphere because it's going to deviate east if you're going toward the axis, which is any direction away from the equator. So that's what causes us to have these cyclonic storms. If you look at places like Jupiter and Saturn, Jupiter and Saturn have what we call belt zone weather patterns. Their weather, weather patterns just go completely around the planet fundamentally. They do have some cyclonic storms, but they don't have a lot of them because they don't have the conditions that would cause you to have the atmosphere going up and, <laughs> up and down generally. Also, yes, go ahead, sir. Okay, so so there's a good question. If there's one right on the equator, which direction is it gonna go? I don't have an answer, but I know the cyclonic storms never cross the equator. For, for the idea that you're thinking, you know, like they, um, I, I think you can't have a cyclonic storm on, on the equator because you don't have a net coriolis effect. Right? You'd have stuff coming in like this and both going that way without a net. Yeah, and that so rotation. The safest place to live theoretically would be on the equator. Uh, from from cyclones. Wait, would that be they wouldn't form on the equator, or they? Would, they, they 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 can form right off of the equator. Okay, you're just saying they right. wouldn't form on the equator, but they can still no. hit places on the equator. No, no, because they 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 never cross the equator. They they don't go towards the equator. They go okay. away from the equator. Oh. Of course, I am not a weather professional. That's my understanding. Has anyone taken a flight that's like going halfway around the world, like from here to China and back? Uh, I've done Amsterdam. Ooh. <laughs> I did too. Two years ago. Russell. Does a flight from Bermuda to California? Uh, from Bermuda to California? Um, probably. Have you noticed that it takes more time going than coming? Thing, like if you're taking a road trip to a certain place and then coming back, it's always. Well, it depends, it depends on which way you started. If you started from China and came to the US, it would be reversed. The flights are like two hours different between flying from here to China. And I think it was, I didn't pay attention to directions, I should have. But it, it's, it's two hours different going one direction than it is going the other direction. Why? Yeah. Why? That's what we're talking here. We're in physics class. Um, Russ, you had a question? Yeah. What a flight from New York to London also. Um, probably, yeah. What ba mean? Basically, if you're going east-west, okay? If you're going north-south, it doesn't count. Doesn't it also have to do with like, wind patterns and stuff? That's it. Okay, yeah. It has to do with the wind patterns because if you look at that picture in the top right, it's showing you what the basic prevailing winds are on Earth. You have the equator is hot, and so you have air rises at the equator and as that air rises you're going to have really nothing because it's at the equator but then it moves in the other upper atmosphere north or south depending on which side of the equator it is and as it moves it's moving to a smaller radius and as it moves to a smaller radius according to the Coriolis effect what's it going to do deviate toward the Toward the east. So if you have a flight that's east, that should be going with the uh, the high weather um, trade wind. Excuse me. When it's going like so the it, east it, direction, yeah. you're going to get that. Question. So it should it should be that direction according to the logic we just applied. Now you have different elevations will have different things because at low elevation it's coming back in. And so if you're flying in the low elevation where it's coming back toward the equator, then it's going the opposite direction. I think actually you're flying at that region. <laughs> so, so I think as this picture shows, I think the prevailing trade winds are like that in what we fly in. So they certainly are for people who are sailing. Once again, I'm not a weather pro here, so I don't know where the differentiation is. Yeah. Yeah, when you're going sailing, they're definitely westward. And the, the question is, when you're flying, are you up in the high altitude or the low altitude? 
Do what? Doesn't it depend on how much plane you're in? Like whether what Well the altitude you're, you're flying at does, but I don't think that I don't think they need what planes move from one to the other. But I, I don't know enough. I can't speak definitively about it. But those the reason for the difference in the speed in flights is because of the Coriolis effect. The reason for cyclonic storms is the Coriolis effect. And what's the last one that you actually all knew that I haven't talked about? The what? I, I'm, it's a cyclone, a tornado is a cyclonic storm, so I'm just putting those two together. Most people bring up flushing toilet. Ooh. I mean, The Simpsons did a whole episode on that, so that like, on the toilet going opposite direction, southern hemisphere is northern hemisphere. And so most people, that's what they know of the Coriolis effect. Here's the thing. For something as small as a toilet, the water's only dropping like this far, the effect is so small that about you know, 50 and a half percent of the time it would swirl one direction and 49 and a half percent of the time it would swirl the other direction because the, the effect is so small that small deviations like, you know, something stuck to the side of the bowl will have a bigger effect than the Coriolis effect. So why is it that our toilets, except for we bought these cheesy toilets that don't swirl a couple of years ago, water saver, bad idea. You actually want the water to swirl around your toilet to clean the toilet bowl. Just a heads up when you go buying toilets. Why do our toilets all swirl the same direction? Because they make the water come out at an angle. And so that makes it so it's always going to swirl the same direction. If they may come out the other angle, it would swirl that direction too because the Coriolis effect is so small in the, the strength. So your toilet bowl's draining is actually not a result of the Coriolis effect. So you might have seen it was popular on YouTube a year or two ago for people to be like on the equator and they have a dish over here and the water swirls one way and then they go to the other side of the equator and swirls the other way and then they go to right on the equator and it just goes straight down. Yeah, that's focus. <laughs> right? There's certainly not enough differentiation going 10 feet to cause a difference in the swirling pattern. And so they're taking a known scientific thing and making a bogus example with it, which, yeah, which is terrible. Right. Okay. Now moving away from that, maybe a practical application of centripetal force. I just want to make sure I got this in here. The centripetal force is the resultant force necessary to go in a circle. And to go in a circle, you have to have an acceleration that's V squared over R. So as V gets bigger, it gets bigger. As R gets smaller, it gets bigger. And so if you're driving a race car, which all of us hope to do someday, right? No? Okay. If you're driving a race car, the goal is to get around the track the fastest. And so there's a couple ways you might try to achieve that. One is the shortest possible path. Shortest possible path would mean you stay right on the inside of all the curves. But then there's another one, the highest possible speed. The highest possible speed means you're going to have to make those radii, larger radii turns, radius turns. And so you see here two paths. This car is taking the shortest possible path around the curve. This one here is making it a much not as steep a, a turn, a much longer radius turn. So this one here can carry more speed through the turn. So I don't know if you guys watch car racing, but they'll talk about the different lines, the low line and the high line. And basically, you're trying to navigate the corners with those lines, and you have some trade-offs. If you have higher acceleration and, and better braking, then uh, one that has a tighter turn might be faster for you. If you have less acceleration, less braking, then the one that's the flatter turn is definitely going to be the advantageous. So some people can race both of them. Some are better at the high line, some at the low line, depending on the car setup. Somebody had a question? Okay, just wanted to get, you know, something, something practical. Because when you are driving from here to your hometown, I don't know about you, but if it's a curvy road and there's no one on the road, I probably cheat on the curves a little. <laughs> there, there's some physics involved here. 
Okay, don't crash your car. Obeying the laws is probably a good way to avoid that. Probably. Okay, now we're going to shift to gravitational force. We've already talked about gravitational force. What can you tell me about gravitational force? Russell? Keeps people down. It what? Keeps people down. Keeps people down. <laughs> Holding them. It's the man. Holding me down. Gravity, man. <laughs> so, gravity does hold us down. What else do you know? Attracts things to each other. Now, that's technically going beyond what we've learned. I've mentioned that. But we haven't gotten to the full equation, which we will here. What's our history on the understanding of gravity? That goes to Newton. In the year, or 18 months, whatever it was, when he was certainly not sitting at the ocean, by the way, when school was canceled because of the Black Plague, and Newton was at Grandma's house doing nothing but physics and inventing calculus and that kind of stuff, there is the apocryphal story, the story of questionable truth, about him sitting under a tree and an apple falling in, on his head and him having a eureka moment. Okay, now let's pronounce this right. It's bonsai. Bonsai and bonsai. Bonsai is the wind of the gods. Bonsai is whatever. What are you talking about? Oh, that tree? What's that Chinese thing? Chinese. Okay, Russell, I think might have something on topic. Okay, so we'll we'll go to this picture, okay? So the story is he's sitting under a tree and an apple falls on his head. And one of my colleagues when I was at PUC you know, he's a physics professor, so of course he's going to do the nerd tour. And he goes to the college where he wasn't in session at the time, and they point out the tree he was sitting under when he wasn't even there. He also went to his grandmother's house, and they point out the tree he was sitting under. Because, of course, there probably was no tree he was sitting under to begin with. So what's all this thing about? What's the story with Newton and the apple about? Very interesting. To make a point... Just like Galileo dropping balls off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Probably never happened. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's used as an example to say that the gravitation is going to act the same on both objects. So what he was thinking was, up until this point, basically the idea was, I can't put a force on you unless I touch you. So if I want to put a force, I always put a force on Andy, so I'm going to go to Diana this time. If I want to put a force on Diana, I can't just go, or for my Street Fighter movies, you go, I'm joking. You know, it's not going to work. I have to actually touch her. Then I can put a force on her. Then I can push her pull. But. <laughs> but he was saying, okay, if that's the case, then why does an apple fall from a tree? Because there's nothing pulling it down up there, right? And it just falls. So he said there must be a force that's acting at a distance that gravity must not require contact. I just think it's so funny that like <laughs> such a like normal idea to us now is so crazy to think. Yeah, well, I mean, if you go back to Aristotle, he said that if I take two balls and one is more massive, but not more massive, one has more earth, thus it wants to be on the earth more, and thus it falls at a faster speed. To us, that seems absolutely ridiculous, right? We go around and say, Aristotle was crazy. That was Looney Tunes. But yeah, like you said, that's what he believed in. That's what people believed for thousands of years. And now we look at that and we say, well, that's dumb. Duh, that's not what happens. Is it harder to like come up with scientific like breakthroughs now because so many of the common sense things have been taken care of? <laughs> I, I reckon so, yeah. <laughs> now back to this. So he was like, there is a force that's acting at a distance. And then he's like, if there's a force acting at a distance on the apple, what about the moon? Shouldn't there be a force acting at a distance on the moon too? And of course, the apple, when it was in the tree, the tree was holding it up to counter that force of distance. 
what about the moon? There's nothing holding the moon up there, right? As far as we know, as far as he knew, and we still are with him, there's nothing holding the moon up. So why doesn't the moon do what an apple does? <laughs> good response, good response. Yeah, it's going to fall straight down on your head any day. Let's just hope that it's not directly overhead when it starts to fall. So as he was thinking about that, I got my tennis ball back, yes. <laughs> you pay attention to the song of the tennis ball. He was thinking, okay, here's what we know. The earth is a sphere. How long have we known the earth was a sphere? Considerable amount of time. Considerable amount of time. The race of the, of the earth was known, what, about 300 years before Christ was born. It was carefully measured. So the earth's creation has not Yes, well, uh, compared to my lifetime, it's many tens of my lifetimes. You know, it's been, let's say, 2,500 years just between friends. So we've known definitively with experiments that the Earth is a sphere. And so he said, okay, the Earth is a sphere, and if I had a ball rolling on the table, and it's going slowly, it falls really close to the surface of the table, right? Or to the edge. But if it's going faster, it's going to travel farther before it hits the ground. And the Earth being a sphere, if I throw this ball fast enough, it can fall at the same rate of the curvature and just stay at the same elevation as it's constantly falling. Yeah, well, yes, that's exactly what satellites are doing, yes. The moon is a satellite. It's a naturally occurring satellite rather than artificial satellite. So then Newton did some experiments. And there have been a lot of experiments. I'll show you the, uh, the standard experimental design in just a minute. And came up with a relationship that says the force of gravity is always attractive. Somebody already said that. Always attractive. So all of us are attracted to all the others of us gravitationally. It's a very small force, though, because it's a constant times the mass of one object times the mass of the other object divided by the separation squared. So R is the separation between the centers. So G, boy, I didn't look this up before class. <laughs> it's either minus 9 or minus 11. I didn't look up the number. Okay. <laughs> you guys... We're doing great. Somebody look it up. Somebody so I don't like look really stupid. I mean, I know I look stupid because I don't remember it, but you know, don't want to go on. But that's a really small number. And the mass of you or the mass of me, they're on the orders of it's negative eleven. Okay. Okay. Obviously it does make a difference. So our masses are on the order of 100 kilograms or less, generally speaking. I mean, some of us, some of us are over 100, but most of you are not. So our masses are on the order of 100. Let's say we had two people, each one being 100 kilograms. Mass one times mass two would be 100 times 100 is 10,000, or 10 to the fourth. Divide by the separation. Let's just make you separate by a meter. So basically. Typical distance between two students. So you have 10 to the fourth divided by 1 squared. Multiply it out by 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. And you get 6.67 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons. You know, that's basically 7 ten millionths of a newton. That's a, a force really, of really small force. What? That's a force of gravity. That's the force of gravity between, for instance, you and David, roughly speaking. It's really small, so you don't feel it. Because it's too small for us to feel. Russ, you had a question? No. But if you have a smaller radius, it would get bigger. So if you get closer to somebody, it gets bigger. How close do you have to get to feel it? Closer than you can get and not be inside of the other person's skin. So you're never going to feel the gravitational force between you and another person. But if you have a big, massive object, like the Earth, then that mass, the mass of the Earth is, what, something on the order of 10 to the 24th kilograms? 
So you take 10 to the 24th kilograms times your mass, 10 to the 2, gives you a total of 10 to the 26. Multiply it by G, 10 to the 26 times 10 to the minus 11 is 10 to the 15. Then you divide by the radius of the Earth squared, which is on the order of 10 to the 6th. So square that 12, 15 minus 12, you still have something on the order of 10 to the 4th. Of course, I'm not exactly right because I was just taking orders of magnitude and numbers and I approximated 7 to be 1. And, you know. But that gives you a reasonably large force then because the mass of the Earth is so large. The mass of the sun is 10 to the 30th kilograms and, well, 2 times 10 to the 30th. So the mass of the sun being much bigger, it puts a really big force on you. And even though the sun is farther away than the earth by quite a bit, I believe it's still a stronger force on you than the earth is. So why are we not floating? Well, if you think about it, we are. No. The earth is orbiting the sun. <laughs> and we are also orbiting the sun. That's cool. But we're also attracted to the earth. We're attracted more to the sun than we are to the earth. But we're attracted to the sun just like the earth is, so we don't feel ourselves being pulled away from the earth. Because we're both being pulled away from the sun. But if the earth wasn't here, would I just be like pulled to the sun? If the earth wasn't here, you'd orbit by yourself. It'd be very cold and lonely and sad. But you would still orbit just like the earth is. And I'd orbit in this dimension right here. Like, I wouldn't mm -hmm. move anywhere. I'd still be like, hold on, chilling in this. Yeah. Technically, so watch this. Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. <laughs> I'm with you. So the force of gravity is negative minus 1 day, right? The acceleration. Yeah. Oh, never mind. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So what's <laughs> the acceleration to the sun? Um, wouldn't they cancel out? Think about it. We, we can do this. Let, let's, I, I know I am just, I'm going to need people to look up numbers, but it's a good question and it's a fun question. So we have two ways of doing it, I'm trying to get to the same slide we're on here. We have two ways of doing it. We can either say the force of the sun on max is equal to capital G, mass of the sun, mass of max over the radius from the sun to the earth squared. Is that the earth's, the the earth's, earth's surface or the earth's core? Yeah, is that center mass to center mass? I, we go from center of mass to center of mass. I, I'm glossing over a few things because the acceleration of gravity in the earth does change based on you know other things because the earth is not perfectly spherical. Is but the sun perfectly spherical? Much more so than the earth, and the earth is but very close to perfectly that? spherical. From measurements. The sun. <laughs> no, no, we haven't. We we have collected some matter from the sun by by having a satellite come and, and sweep up some stuff. But yeah, we anyway. Moving on beyond the jokes. This is the equation for the force between Max and the sun, where the R S E is the radius between the center of the sun and the center of the Earth. Why do I use the center of the Earth? Well, so half the time Max is on the side closer to the sun, half time is farther. On average, Max is at the position of the center of the Earth away from the sun. Now, we should also point out, and Russell knows this, he hasn't even raised his hand. Think of that restraint, that the distance between the sun and the Earth varies. We will be closest to the sun right after the start of the new year. Why? Oh, because we're okay. We, we do an elliptical okay. orbit, which actually is coming up in the following slides, although I'm not planning on talking about that. So the question that Max asked was about what is the acceleration? Let's start by calculating the force of gravity on you due to the sun and due to the earth. So due to the earth, it's easy. Now we're going to just assume you're 100 kilograms and not quibble, okay? So the force of the earth on Max is G mass of the earth, mass of max over radius of the earth squared, right? Yeah. Using the same equation. We usually take this here, capital G times mass of the earth divided by radius of the earth squared, and we just calculate that number separately. And you know what we get? Yeah, we get 9.80. That's where it comes from. And so that's equal to 9.80 meters per second squared times his 100 kilograms. 
So the force of gravity of the Earth pulling Max onto the Earth is 980 newtons. Now, the force of gravity between Max and the Sun, this is where I need people to look up numbers for me. So the mass of the sun, I'm pretty sure it's 2.0 times 10 to the 30, but somebody can check. <laughs> yeah, 1.98. We're just going to go with two. And what's the distance between the sun and the earth? It's 90.86 million miles, which is 1496046186 kilometers. Okay, 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters squared. And then, of course, we have to remember to put masses, the max of max out here. Wait, so then do we also account for the radius of the sun and the Earth? Um, for, for the radius of the sun, it doesn't matter because the sun is very uniform. And as long as you're farther out than the, than the radius of, let's say, the photosphere, you're fine. You just go to the center. For the Earth, yes, there's going to be some variation, but the variation is going to be more with how close we are to the sun than where you are on the Earth. Okay. And so we're just basically taking an average value. Okay. So someone actually calculate this instead of me doing order of magnitude calculations in my head. 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times 2 times 10 to the 30 divided by 1.5 times 10 to the 11th quantity squared. And my calculation is it's actually much less than the, than your weight now that we've done the calculation. And, mine's error. and yours is error. I got to the bottom. What'd you get? get the, parts. the bottom is 2.25. Yeah, 2 times 10 times to the 22. 22. Yeah. 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 Times 10 to 22. The, the top is 1.34 times 10 to the uh, minus, or 10 to the 20? The answer is 0 0.005 for the total, or no? 0.592888. Okay, so, so I was wrong in my contention that it's a stronger force. It's much stronger than the moon is what I was thinking. Is that, and that's a correct statement. The force of the sun on you is stronger than the force of the moon on you. Okay, so you're being pulled with that force toward the sun. It's, it, it's, it's enough to, to feel that it's very small. Russell? Wait, if the sun's force we are going to get to that. That's part of the lecture. Okay, so the sun is pulling us in, but it turns out not nearly as strongly as gravity is holding us to the earth. But even if it was pulling us with that strength, we're, the earth is also falling with us, so we'd still be stuck on the earth. Okay, back to the regular presentation we go. And what effects does this have? Well, orbiting. I should just stay in the other because I'm going to go back and work the problem here too. We orbit the sun because of gravity. The moon orbits the earth because of gravity. We orbit technically the very center, the center of mass between the objects. So, you know, we, we say that the earth is orbiting the sun and some smart aleck might tell you, no, we don't. We orbit the center of mass between the Earth and the Sun, which is about, um, what is it, two-thirds of the way from the center of the Sun to the photosphere of the Sun. It's still within the Sun. But the Sun technically is also doing a little orbit around that very center. So we're doing something like this. But the Sun's motion is very, very small. Ours is much bigger. And we're not the only planet orbiting the Sun. And so all of the planets are involved in this little dance which means the sun's position is doing a bunch of little wiggle and shake because of all the planets orbiting it. That's actually going to affect our orbit as it shakes because of the other orbits, right? So our orbit does change over time, but it also provides something that helps us look for exoplanets, planets orbiting other stars besides the sun. Because the sun is just a star. It's our star. It's the closest star. And so other stars, if they have planets orbiting, they will also be doing the little jiggles 
from the planets. And so they analyze the jiggles they see in the motion of stars, and from that they infer orbits of planets about the stars. <laughs> okay, I better move on before I make Anna too sick. So coming to this, I want to talk about the orbital mechanics real quick before we get to tides. We're not going to get to work clearly because we had too much fun. Please, let's. Let me finish this, then I can talk about a black hole. Sure, why not? I mean, if you're interested in physics, I'm all there. So, the Earth orbiting the Sun or the Moon orbiting the Earth, they both, both are basically the same thing. You have, and I, I will do the Earth orbiting the Sun, and I'll do the approximation of a stationary infinite, well, it'd have to be infinite mass to be stationary, but a stationary Sun. Yes. It is not. You're correct. Doesn't affect my calculation here. So, if this is the entirety of the universe, the sun and the earth, ignoring everything else, what's the free body diagram for the earth? The free body diagram. The three forces coming Three forces? Two. Two? Only one? Yeah, one. Oh my gosh. What's the force acting between the sun and the earth? Gravity. Gravity. And what direction is it? Toward the sun. Toward the sun. Okay, so there we're on some, some winds. Free body diagrams can only have one direction? No. No. Okay, I'll no. Forces. no, but I'm just looking at the forces. Okay. So there's the force acting on the earth. That's all of them. Now we're going to start with an assumption that the Earth is doing a perfectly circular orbit. It's not. It's close to circular. Our answer is approximately true, but it's not perfectly true. So if the Earth is doing a perfectly circular orbit, then we know some of the forces toward the center must be mass times acceleration toward the center. What do we call that acceleration toward the center? And what's its value? Acceleration is okay. V squared over R or omega squared R is what you were thinking. Yeah, that one. So we know the sum of the forces toward the center must be mass times speed squared over radius. Well, that radius is the same radius Earth to Sun. So I'm just going to drop the ES to make my writing less. So applying Newton's second law in the central direction, which we call the centripetal or centripetal um, force, I'm going to have. G mass of Earth, mass of Sun, over radius squared is equal to, which object's mass was that? When you use Newton's second law, the mass, of the, earth. the mass of the Earth, because I had been looking at the free body diagram for the Earth, I was applying Newton's second law to the Earth. So I get this relationship right off the bat that relates the force of gravity to the mass times centripetal acceleration. Notice the first thing of importance is the mass of the orbiting object cancels out. The mass that's being orbited matters, but not the mass of the orbiting object, which is why Sarah would follow the same orbit that the Earth is following if the Earth wasn't here. Because it doesn't matter that Sarah has a different mass. It's not part of the calculation. If the sun's mass changed, that would change everything. Oh, sure, it loses billions of tons a day, but <laughs> compared to its total mass, that's nothing. So over the course of, like, over the length of time that we've been on Earth, and the sun's been the sun, since, okay, so since creation, mm -hmm. have we gotten closer to the sun? Honestly, I haven't thought anything about that. I know the Earth is getting, or the Moon is getting farther from the Earth. I know that answer, but I do not know about the Earth's distance from the Sun. I, I am sure I've read people talking about it, but I don't remember which way, so I can't. How is the Moon getting further from the Earth? We'll talk about that too. Shall time last? Shall I get through black holes? <laughs> so, notice also that one radius is canceled here. So I'm left with 
g times the mass of the sun over the radius, the distance between the sun and the earth, is equal to the speed squared. Yeah, because it's not a vector speed. I, I say velocity way too often. Now, if we're doing a circle, I can say that for a circle, don't want that color, for a circle, V is equal to the circumference. What's the equation for circumference? 2 pi r divided by the time it takes to do one orbit, the period. The year is our period, right? And so I'm going to substitute that in. And solve this for period. Why solve it for period? Because I want to. So if I solve this for period, I have, I'm just rewriting. I'm going to have to multiply both sides by period squared and divide both sides by g mass of sun over r. And I have period squared is equal to 4 pi radius cubed over g mass of the sun. This is actually known as Kepler's law, or Kepler's third law. <laughs> Johannes Kepler came up with three laws of orbital motion that he came up just by observing the motion. He had no physics reason for it. And then when Newton came around, and Newton came up with his law of universal gravitation, and his math of calculus, which actually allows you to do this calculation for even if it's not a circular orbit, Newton's law showed that there was a science reason, a physics reason why Galo, or why Kepler, his three laws work. So Kepler's three laws, law number one, that the planets do elliptical orbits about the sun. Not circles, ellipses, with the sun at one of the two focal points of an ellipse. Now you might be wondering, what in the world does he mean by two focal points of the ellipse? This picture is a very bad picture <laughs> because it shows the sun at the center. And that ain't it. If, if it's offset, then it might be okay. You have two foci that are symmetrically placed in an ellipse, such that if you were to take a string and go from one foci to any point on the ellipse to the other, the total length of the blue lines there is the same. That's, a de that's a, one definition of an ellipse. And so the sun is at one of these, and the other one's empty. His second law says that the area swept out per unit time is constant. What that means is when you're closer, the area of the line going from the sun to you has to sweep out the same amount of area per day as when you're farther away. What that means, remember it means the road, is you have to go faster when you're closer, slow when you're farther away. And then the third thing is what we just worked out, that the period, and Kepler just has period squared is proportional to radius cubed. But using Newton's laws, we can get what the exact ratio is. Okay, black holes, tides, oh my goodness. What's your question? How does it have infinite density? A black hole? Or is it just like a big number? Just so the idea of a black hole was first, first brought up by theologian slash scientist, was it Thomas More? Oh. Um, and he said, when something, okay, we just saw here that there is a speed for something going in a circle. There's also what we call an escape velocity, which is part of the next chapter. That's how fast something has to travel to get away. So, for instance, if you, it's twice the circular velocity, I think it is. Or maybe, no, it's, it's square root of two times the circular velocity. And so, on Earth, something has to travel 11.2 kilometers per second at the surface of the Earth to be going fast enough to escape from us. So Thomas More said, well, what if you had an object that had more mass in the same volume? In that case, somebody left some washer said, in that case, the escape velocity goes up. Because notice that circular velocity, which of course you can't see right now, the circular velocity is V squared is G mass over R. And so if the if the mass goes up and the radius stays the same then it's going to be a higher circular velocity and multiply that thing by two and that's the escape speed squared. 
So if, if you have enough mass in a small enough region, you can make it so the escape velocity, the speed something has to have to leave, is bigger than the speed of light. But if nothing can go faster than the speed of light, that means light wouldn't be able to get away from it. And so he termed this a dark star. And that dark star idea is morphed into what we call a black hole. Since light can't come out, by definition, it's black. They're black means there's no light coming out. Who determines that definition? Excuse me? Who determines that definition? I, I don't know. So a black hole just means that you have more mass per unit volume, or enough mass per unit volume that light cannot escape. What's going on inside? We don't really know. Some people posit that it truly is a singularity that all forces known to man, the strong, we, we, you know, the, or me, the, um, the degeneracy force that keeps neutrons from collapsing through neutrons, has overcome, and there's no other force we know of that would keep it from collapsing. And so it collapses to a, a, a singularity. Other people say, that just can't be. You can't put all of this mass at one point. There must be some other force, something else we don't know about. And so there, we don't know. Okay, it's time to go. Russ has a question, but yeah, you can still ask me questions, but I can't, I've got to let you go. Sarah. What's the question, Russ? Okay, so what? the Earth is swimming really, really slowly away from the sun? Um, the white holes are actually, the theory that's the right white hole is if you have two black holes that link together with the Einstein Rosen Bridge and the White Nose Long Hole. One will be a black hole, one will be a white hole, and then you start to the black hole and then you out the white hole and then you the white hole. What was your question, Andy? You asked me if the Earth is moving slowly away from the sun. Yes. Both of you, just like it sounds. Both of you, this is my boat. I need you on the phone. Yes, what are you doing? What's she doing? Um, the Earth is moving slowly away from the sun because of the tidal interaction. Just like the moon. The sun and the Earth. Yes. Okay, what's your name? Cool. That was it. Cheers. Okay, I'll help you out. Which question? Did you know? That's not battery. That's not battery. Did you know? Still, you're touching someone's belt with me. Okay, which question? Did you know? Nothing. Just finally completed the rotation. Is what? Finally completed the rotation. Ah, no. 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 If you're not the only one, that's one of the other ones. Finally, the one. Since the scope. 